Fire Call, the Fire Safety Show with Division Chief Jim Sedaris. Hi, my name is Division Chief Jim Sedaris, and you're watching Fire Call. And this is time you can spend with the brave men and women of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue as we talk about our department and answer some of your email questions and kind of give you a behind the scenes tour of what goes on behind a large fire department, behind America's fire department. This month, we're going to actually be taking a worldwide extravaganza tour of email questions. We've gotten email questions from around the world. And uh, this first one comes from Mauricio in Santiago, Chile. And Mauricio writes, Haste que andad un pueda ser bombarderos. How old do you have to be to be a firefighter? And the answer is, for Sioux Falls Fire Rescue, the answer is going to be, Venta y uno. 21 to be a firefighter. So spend the rest of the time with us and take a step into the world of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Our next question comes from James in Austin, Texas, and he wants to know what kind of schedule do firefighters work? I have Captain Jeff Winters with me, and he has the perfect answer for this question. I'm going to have to break this down for you a little bit because it's kind of confusing to the public. What we do is we're on a 204-hour, 27-day cycle, or 53 hours a week. An example would be this week, my shift is scheduled to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We work 16 hours on Monday, 8 on Tuesday, midnight to 8 o'clock in the morning. Wednesday is 16 hours, Thursday is 8 hours, Friday is 16 hours, and Saturday is 8 hours. We're available for calls that entire 24 hours. At any time, the alarm can go off, and we will respond to an emergency. Good enough for you? I think hopefully James can figure that one out. All right. Thanks, Jeff. You bet. Next. Our next question for Don Hilsenroth. You ready, Don? Yes, sir. Okay. This one comes from Heather in Mentor, Ohio. Hey. <laughs> All right. That's only a little bit away from my house. Well, that's good. Maybe we'll send you back, buddy. <laughs> what does SCBA stand for? SCBA stands for Self-Contained Breathing Apparatus. And what is it, Don? You want to have this on when you go into a burning building. You, this is your fresh air. If you do not have this on, you can't fight fires. Okay, ready to throw it on? Sure. Wait, let me time you. Ready, set, go. You have to go faster, Don. Like this, we have a so we can hear our amplified voice. Now, when you're when you're breathing in that, is the air hot or cold? People are going to want to know. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice it's there. It's not hot or cold. And now this thing that you're talking, this thing that you're talking through is a microphone. Yep. So you use that, and hold it up to your uh, radio, and talk. You can, yes, you can. That's how it's easy to communicate when you're in the fire. Uh, you're the man, Don. Thank you. Okay, you want to say next? Next. Oh. <laughs> okay, Firefighter Skiles, also known as? DJ. Also known as? Scotty. Also known as? Chad. Also known as? Teddy. Okay. <laughs> and you answered to just about? Anything. There you go. <laughs> You're going to go far in this department. This question is from Brandon in Tigger, Oregon. And Brandon wants to know, what is a pass device? And how does it keep our firefighters safe? PASS, P-A-S-S, what's it stand for? Personal Alert Safety System. Uh, it's this deal right here. What is basically a motion detector. Um, so if a firefighter gets injured or something and quits moving, after 30 seconds it starts to alarm. And now why, gets, why is that important? If he, I mean, why is it important that we know if he's moving or not? Uh, I mean, he could be trapped under something. He could be unconscious anything if and that that way we know there's somebody in there not moving okay. we can go in and get them and we can go we basically work by the sound to get to him exactly now how much time we got to until this thing fires off donnie you should be used to not moving for about 30 seconds <laughs> we'll seeing you in action we'll make it go off right now okay that's the warning and that's going to go off yep and it will get progressively louder Now, that'll just keep going on until we find him. Yep. 
Okay. There you go. Well, thanks, right. DJ. Yep. This next question comes from Rachel in Sioux Falls, and Rachel wants to know what do firefighters do when they're not on an emergency call? And to answer this, we have one of our senior captains, Arlie Grown, to answer this. Arlie, what do you do when you're not on a call? Well, when we're not on a call, we do station maintenance, uh, truck check, uh, training, training, training. We got a lot of training to keep up on all the new standards. Yes. and We're required to do so many hours of training every year. Uh, we do building surveys uh, to check for obvious fire hazards and to fam familiarize yourself with the buildings. So you're, well, you're busy all day long? All day, every day. One of our worldwide questions that we're going to bring up, and this one comes from Andrew, and Andrew lives in Sydney, Australia, and he wants to know, he says, good day from down under. Do you deal with brush wildland fires as well as urban calls? Cheers, Andrew. And also, the same question comes from Aaron in Sioux Falls who wants to know, uh, do we have any grass rigs? Well, Aaron and Andrew, this is it. This is our grass rig, our, our wild, we call it wildland firefighting in the United States. We don't call it brush fighting. And this truck goes pretty much in anywhere. And this is one of our new drivers. His name is Mark Bukovic. And Mark, you're going to kind of show us around this truck a little bit. Tell us about, kind of about, what's the difference between a truck like this and a regular four-wheel drive pickup? Well, basically, this is basically a standard four-wheel drive pickup chassis that's beefed up a little bit. And the other thing that we have done, we've additionally put a flatbed unit on the back that carries a pump and a tank. Uh, the nice thing about these vehicles, we can take them off-road very easily. They're four-wheel drive, just like a regular four-wheel drive pickup. With, with dualies. With the fire, yeah, with the dualies, with the firefighting capability. And the reason we have the dualies on the back is because of the extra weight that we have to sure. carry with the water and the pump that most people don't have to carry in the back of their pickups. Now, wildland firefighting, when you're off-road, do, do the dualies help or hurt? Uh, it depends on what type of uh, uh, ground or terrain you're in. If it's a real muddy ground or terrain, it can be a real drawback, but if it's not real muddy, it's usually not too bad. And if it's a wild land, pretty much it's going to be dry and grass Generally. fiery. Well, show us around this truck. Uh, basically, we have four doors on this truck so we can carry four personnel on this truck. Most of our apparatus throughout the city are always maintained with four people. That way, the entire crew can go on just this truck alone and they can leave other apparatus back. Sure. Um, basically, we start off with coming back here. The flatbed is equipped with the pump and the tank, as we talked about a little bit, as well as compartments for additional equipment. All made out of aluminum for lightweight? Correct. All made out of aluminum for lightweight, as well as watertight, so that we don't sure. have to worry about rain and stuff getting inside of these and ruining the equipment inside. On top here, we've got a small portable pump that we can utilize. It can be carried by personnel down to a creek bed or a small pond that we can draft out of if we're real far in on, a, on, on real bad terrain where the truck necessarily can't get that close to it. We can still pump water out of those areas and pump it up to the truck or up to hand lines if we need to with this small little portable pump well, here. That's a good idea. Uh, in this first compartment here, uh, we've got obviously a fire extinguisher like we carry on all of our, all of our trucks. But also we have a uh, small collapsible backpack that you can fill up with water so the firefighters can actually wear water packs on almost, their back. Almost like the camel backs that we're seeing people wearing in Iraq Exactly. Now, wearing in Iraq. Exactly. Just with more water and the ability to spray it out of a nozzle so that way they can go a remote away from the truck and still fight fire on okay. foot. In this compartment up here, basically we have additional rolls of, of wildland specific hose. And this allows us to do really long hose lades because when we go wildland, a lot of times we have to park the truck uh, further away from where the fire is at. So we have to do long hose stretches sure. to get to where the fire is. Um, we do carry a hose reel, uh, which makes it real quick and easy. If we can get the truck fairly close to where the fire is, we'll just utilize this reel with the hose on it, pull it off, charge the line, and start attacking the fire right away. And that's generally how we utilize this truck in the Sioux Falls area mostly. What's on the other side? Now we got a pump in back. Yep, and here's the pump, smaller than what's carried on uh, our regular engines, rescues in the city limits of Sioux Falls, um, but is uh, very sufficient for the wildland firefighting that we need. Uh, and a 300 gallon tank on the back for 300 gallons of water, as well as we carry foam on this too, just like we do our regular trucks, Class A foam for fighting wildland fires. We talked about the foam before, so we get good penetration into those areas. Exactly. Um, basically, we also carry chainsaws on this truck. Um, general chainsaws that you'd see people cutting trees down around the city of Sioux Falls, we carry on this for the same exact reason. Sometimes we have uh, trees involved in the wildland fire, we need to chop them down in order to get the fire spread stopped. 
as well as when trees have burned. A lot of times they become very dangerous and collapse. In fact, a lot of wildland firefighters are killed every year by following trees. Kind so we want to get those basically. exactly widowmakers. We want to get those taken down as fast as we can, so there's less danger to our personnel. So we carry chainsaws on these type of trucks also to do that. And then we also carry a lot of hand tools, like I talked about a little bit before. A lot of our wildland firefighting is done on foot, away from the truck, and we use a lot of hand tools. This, for instance, is a Pulaski. It's kind of like an axe like we carry on the regular fire engines, except for this back part right here, which you can kind of see. And that's helped to, that, we utilize that to help drag a fire line sure, or so dig can, it up to the dirt get to get rid of the brush. Dig in, and uh, it's, it's just a nice little hand tool that does a little bit of everything. Exactly, yep. You can dig a hand line with it, and you can chop through brush with it also. And then we carry a different assortment of hose connectors, splitters, Ys, uh, different nozzles in case we do extra hose lays, um, different styles of nozzles, whether we need a fog pattern or straight, different wildland nozzles. Because you're pretty much self-sufficient. When you go out, when you get off-road with this, it's pretty much, you, you better carry it with you or you're not going to have it. Yep, and when we go off-road with this with our four-person crew, you have your four-person and everything on this truck, and you're going to have to operate for a while. Throw some meals in the back, and you're good to go. Yep, some MREs usually uh, last us quite a while. Now, this truck does... Uh, a lot of wildland firefighting, and when the one thing we can do is we can also deploy it out to regional areas, like we've been out to Black Hills in South Dakota. Uh, we've also deployed people out to Colorado and Nebraska. Now, how many fires uh, can we use this in the city? Is it pretty practical for an, uh, in that urban interface where we have like all this construction of wildland out here? It's very practical. Uh, we have area that we cover that is rural uh, that we can utilize on as well as some of the urban areas of the city does have an urban interface we call it where there is some brush and some woods that we get fires in along I-229 and areas like that. Railroad that tracks. Very well utilized. The other practicality for this is in the wintertime, if we have a blizzard hit, some of our larger trucks don't get through heavy snow very well, and this is very maneuverable in the wintertime too, and we can utilize this to attack a fire if we need to, if the larger trucks uh, are not able to get through. Great point. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Mark. Mm -hmm. You bet. This next question is from George, and George lives in Levittown, New York, and he wants to know what kind of equipment we have for hazmat situations. Well, George, this is the inside of uh, one of three hazmat trailers. We carry all kinds of equipment in these hazmat trailers to handle just about any type of incident. And this is just kind of one thing I thought about, is if we have a 55-gallon drum that's damaged, we can take that drum, put it in this overpack. Now, what an overpack is, it's just a huge drum that we put the damaged one in. Drop it inside of this, seal it back up, and then we can safely dispose of that. So it's, a, it's just one of the, the key pieces of equipment that we have in this truck. Now, this leads us into a fire we had. We had a pretty good fire recently. It was over 8,000 gallons of uh, fuel, gasoline. It was a tanker detached from the, the uh, truck, tipped over, dumping all this gasoline all over. We had flames. It was at night. We had flames that reached, they're, they're estimating, uh, over 200 feet in the air. Well, some of the things we had to worry about this is our our firefighters showed up to this as, boy, this is a real safety deal. We really have to worry about safety on all these issues. And part of that is going to be, where is this gasoline going? Some of the gasoline was actually flowing into the storm uh, system, you know, the, the little inlets you have in the street, flowing through that. And at one point, that exploded. So we had gasoline underground exploding for several blocks. And as it was exploding, it was blowing the manhole covers off, which was you know, caught, got a lot of people's attention really quick. But we had to worry now at night about having open holes in the sidewalks that firefighters could fall into. We had to worry about this gasoline flowing into the river. And if you would watch, and you can go back and watch previous episodes, you, sh you saw how we shot booms across the river to pick up petroleum. We did the exact same thing because we had so much gasoline flowing. Key thing we did for this fire is we couldn't put it out because it's burning more than we could handle, but we protected the exposures, let it burn, and made sure that this wasn't going to spread anywhere. And it was, uh, it really was uh, a significant fire for us. Now, we also had to bring in crews, so the brave men and women of Sioux Falls Fire Rescue really took quite a while to bring this whole situation under control, and they were there um, for quite a long time. So those are the kind of things, George, that we have to worry about when we're talking about hazardous materials incidents. Our next question comes from Zachary, and Zachary lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 
Zachary wants to know, what's that red thing on top of the fire hydrants? Well, Zachary, this red thing's a marker, and this marker allows us to find the fire hydrants both uh, when we're driving down the street, you can see them quite a ways away, but as we start to think about winter here, we might get snow drifts all the way up to cover up the fire hydrant completely. This allows us to locate that fire hydrant when these uh, either get drifted over or the plows come over and plow these fire hydrants over. It's a great time to start thinking about if you have a fire hydrant in your yard and it starts to snow, it's to shovel out about three feet around that fire hydrant because then we can wrap the hose around, pull off, uh, to the fire and we can also loosen up these caps real easy. It's tough to do when we have to dig out a fire hydrant that's buried this high in snow. So Zachary, I hope that answers your question and thanks for watching. Pop quiz, it's your time to either be a hero or a zero. Here's a question. House fires, what kills most people in house fire? Your choices are A, fire, B, smoke, C, building collapse, D, explosion. The answer is B, smoke. A lot of times you're in bed sleeping. You don't know that smoke is out there. You might not see the fire. It's going to kill you. How can you prevent that? It leads us into our next section. Welcome to the Fire Institute of Technology. Now this next question calls for some really serious thinking. So we have to put on our, our thinking hats for this one. It comes from Raymond. Raymond lives in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And he wants to know how many smoke alarms should be purchased and where should they be installed in one's home? Well, Raymond, that's a very good question. And when we look at a scaled home, we have to think of a couple things. We want to put a smoke detector on each level of your home. Basement, uh, mid-level, upstairs, to ensure that if there's a fire spreads, the smoke is going to uh, cause those alarms to go off. So one of these on every floor. Another thing we want to think of is the actual placement. And you have a very good question. When we look at the actual placement, we have our kitchen, dining room area, but the place that we need to have the earliest protection is in these bedrooms. So the recommendation is to put them outside of your bedroom area to allow for rapid notification when you're sleeping. Very important, outside the bedrooms. And another thing to think about with these smoke detectors, they're very inexpensive. We want to replace your smoke detectors regardless if they're battery, like this one is, or if they're hardwired, to replace them every 10 years because uh, they just get old and wore out and by golly, you gotta take care of that kind of stuff. They're easy to put up. They come with instructions and batteries and you put them on the wall. When we put these up, we want to uh, replace them every 10 years. We want to do a monthly check. So there's a little button on it and you push the button and it will tell you if the battery's good. Check it monthly and replace the battery every year. Usually when you set your, uh, for daylight savings time, for those of you that have daylight savings time, you can set, uh, get a battery. It's very easy to replace your battery and do it every, every uh, year. These are very simple to use devices. They're easy to mount and there's a little button. Now you can push the button. This is pretty loud. Check it every month. When you mount these, they're very simple. There's just a couple of, of screws. Now, where you mount it is critical on your wall. When we look at our wall, here's our wall. If an area we want to avoid is this area. So we want to go down four inches to 12 inches from here. That's four inches down. Now the reason is, this four inch mark right here is called dead air. We don't have the smoke rising up into these corners. So four inches to 12 inches is the optimum location for those smoke detectors. The same thing when you're putting them flush up on your ceiling is you want to stay four inches away from the corner. Avoid
avoid that area right there because you're not getting any smoke there. These things aren't going to work very well. When you hear that alarm go off constantly, you need to get out of the house. Fill your door, plan ahead. Everyone should know where do we need to meet. So we want you to practice those emergency drills in the home. Where do we need to meet? Don't go back in for anything. Don't worry about your pets. Don't worry about your fish. Get out of the house. Call 911. And that's how simple these are. This will save your life. You need to have one. For some fire departments, give them away for free. Listen and ask, and if not, it's probably the best $7 you're ever gonna spend. Now everybody wants to get a t-shirt, that's the big deal. Well, here's how you get it, buddy boy. Send those darn email questions in. If we use your email questions, and it's a good question, I'm gonna send you a Genuine Sioux Falls Fire Rescue t-shirt. That's for good questions that we use. Now, another thing we have is if you use your question, send us a picture of you and your t-shirt by something that your town's noted for. Maybe in front of one of your rigs, maybe in, for you guys in Australia in front of a kangaroo. What we're going to do is we're going to take those pictures and try and get them up on our website so we can have a, a little potpourri of pictures for you. So the last thing we have is a shout out. Now if you want your fire department shouted out, you just send me an email and of course I know what you're going to ask, you'll get a t-shirt too. This shout out goes, is from Bryce in Chicago Heights. He wants the Chicago Heights Fire Department to get a shout out, and this one's going to you, Bryce. So thanks for spending time with us. We really enjoyed having you. My name is Devin Chief, Jim Sedaris, and you've been watching Fire Call.